Here we go. Cheers. Cheers, my friend. Good to be good to be back in the van. I'm so glad to see you again. Yeah, likewise. You took a well deserved break and then were rudely <laughs> interrupted with the global pandemic. You know, you you can you only have control over so much in life. And uh <laughs> One of those things is definitely not a pandemic. At the moment, we have none. No control, it seems. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a weird time. Um, but, you know, I've, I've found that even, even in the weird times like this, uh, beautiful things happen in the country. And so even though it seems like, you know, yeah. all is going to absolute hell, you know, I think there's going to be some good that comes out of this. We're going to come out of it with memories. Well, something's good is going to come out of this podcast. That's right. Nothing Cheers. Else. Sam 76. I really do like this beer, by the way. That is good. Thank you. Yeah. Usually I, Sam Adams I'm not super fond of, but, uh, but this, is, this is good. I like some of their stuff, uh, and I'm the – out of all the – the beer connoisseur uh, douchebags in my group. <laughs> I'm the lager, American lager, German lager type. And man, at a, on a hot day like today, that that yeah, is, this is good. Spot. This yeah. is good. And it's uh, that's the one we discovered uh, sailing on a sailing trip. So, man, I really, really, really wanted to get you in here after I saw your letter to the Odessa American. Yeah, I, that is a beautiful piece of work, my friend. Well, I I appreciate that. You know, I was I was hoping to have it uh, published in the Midland Reporter Telegram, and wasn't able to get in touch with them. So, uh, you know, the the folks over at the Odessa American, uh, Laura Dennis, was happy to run it, um, and uh, I'm glad I was able to get that out there because you know it, when you when you when you look at what's happening right now and how complex are the issues that we're dealing with. Um, you know, it's important that sometimes we take a step back and, and I get it. You know, we live in an age where it's it's cool to just, you know, have your Facebook or your Twitter and, and post whatever you're thinking. Uh, and of course, we all have opinions. But in a, when you're dealing with something as complex as, as the issues that we're dealing with right now, I think it's important to for all of us, including including myself. I mean, I'm not I'm not perfect at the concept of this, but I think it's important that we all take time to mindfully listen and observe and, and be cognizant of, of what is happening in the moment and, and truly listen to one another and, and take our hands off the keyboard and try to figure out ways uh, that we can we can sit down and have a conversation and, and move forward on some of these issues. Uh, because like I, like I said, you know, it, mindfully listening, it's not something that even though you think listening is a skill that you naturally have, well, sure, you can naturally listen because you can naturally hear. You can hear most it. of us, <laughs> yeah. But but there's a big difference between hearing and actually listening. Listening to understand, not listening to simply confirm your own uh, beliefs or opinions. And we've we've kind of as a nation and and more broadly, I think as a as a species, we've kind of developed into this. We've developed this mindset where we we have to have a response to everything all the time, and it has to be immediate, and we have to be right. And if we're not right, then we don't want to have the conversation. When in reality, I think that there's 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 right on both sides, and what we have to do is figure out exactly how we come to a, an understanding to where we can figure out, okay, if you believe this and I believe this, how do we live in the same place while believing different things? The only way we can do that is if we understand one another. And um, so that was kind of the idea behind that article, trying to get people to understand the importance of the concept of mindfully listening um, so we can we can better understand one, uh, one another because it's, it's very clear that there are some things when it comes to, you know, blacks and whites and yeah. whatever that, that <laughs> we're just not understanding right I, now. And I like so, we, we came to a realization earlier. You, you mentioned it, that oftentimes you're the one black friend that everybody wants to talk to <laughs> and see. And I'm the yeah. one cop friend. Yeah, that everybody's yeah. like, dude, what do you think about this? <laughs> and I, I had so many calls about it and I haven't been just out there. I haven't posted about it or written about it or even this is the first time we've discussed it on the podcast because we normally stay away from heavy stuff, but I thought this would be an interesting conversation be because of, uh, I, I don't have a whole lot new to say about, you know, solutions or, or anything else. I don't have anything new to put out there. And uh, I've engaged in a little bit of conversation in 
circles on Facebook and things like that. And there's there's no listening. Yeah, the, the, the mindful listening you're, you're talking about. I, don't, I think we're having a hard time with that. But, right, right. But uh, man, I talked to you not long after that incident, and uh, that was a tough day for you. You know, it, it was it it, it it was for a number of reasons. Um, you know, I I, I mean, it, it, I think it was tough for a lot of people, which I which I, do, I think is the reason why you didn't have a lot of disagreement over the absurdity of of what happened to George Floyd. You know it. I think for the most part, people saw that for what it was in a very raw form. Yeah. I mean, you know, that it's similar to what we saw back during, you know, the civil rights movement when you saw police dogs being sicked on people. And, and you, you, even if you might not have generally known what the civil right at that time, what the civil rights movement was about or what was happening to black people, when you saw that, which was one of the first times that sort of protest was aired on television, and you saw the response that it was met with, you realize very quickly that there's something very wrong. There was with something, that. yeah. And I'm in I'm in groups on in various social media, um, the secret groups and all. They're just police, mm-hmm. and some of them are uh, Reddit's uh, Leo. It's cops verified, so it's it's pretty tight. You have yeah. to be a cop to get in there, and. If you could take a snapshot of the country that day, we were all on the same page. Right. I mean, even the police, the 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 knee to the neck thing. Uh, I I've done it. Mm-hmm. Flat out, tell you, I've done it. And a lot of throws that that were trained in uh, different martial arts, they end that way with with that that knee to the neck. I can't imagine doing that for eight minutes and now I feel bad I forgot the number I want to say 845 my, my, yeah my it's not it's not just you uh, <laughs> I hate chemo man. anyway uh, <laughs> for for eight for that long with that many officers around now if right. you're by yourself you know in my case on the county road I've, I've helped I've helped people in carotid restraints totally they went out but different story you can't even hear the siren yet yeah for your backup so we were all on the same page we all saw that there was no um the guy was reaching in his waistband there was no i thought it was a a gun there was no furtive movement there was nothing it was a guy in handcuffs which uh in the 90s police training was very heavy in uh, uh positional asphyxia and things like that where he can lay there and and it's true if you're breathing you can scream and and but you take a guy with your build and if you just held your two thumbs together and laid on the floor you know behind your back like you're in handcuffs you're gonna have problems breathing you add to that anything else Mm -hmm. with drugs or whatever and you'll just have people die in the back seat and we were all cognizant of that and here I am, you know, retired. And I was an academy instructor, and I'm watching this going, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. That long with that much help. And that's what I, I can't imagine. Yeah. Where do you go? So. And, and you, you, can't help, you, you can't help but wonder, uh, and this isn't even a black or a white thing, but you just can't help but wonder what it would be like to be the family member having to watch that. And really, that's that's kind of what broke my heart. You know, it's 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 putting yourself, you know, having enough empathy to put yourself in the position of someone who is a loved one of a guy like George Floyd having to watch this video um, of your loved one or relative get mm. get murdered. Oh, I've, I've, <clears throat> and, I've seen friends of pictures of friends on the on, on the the pathologist slab and and i've had to go through their personal effects and i've even seen video and yeah i can't i can't put that in words it's it's tough but to to kind of expound upon that the the thing that really also hurt is i knew in that moment as soon as that video came out that this this nation was going to tear itself apart um because there has been And now, granted, as I, as I mentioned in the op-ed, you know, the, the United States is a nation filled with scar tissue. You mm-hmm. know, we have had we have had issues in this nation for a long time and we're going to have them probably for years and years to come. You know, and that and that scar tissue will always serve as a reminder of that. Um, but I knew in that moment that we were we were going to be in a little bit of a of a different situation. Yeah. And you talk to people who are even, you know, still alive that were part of the uh, civil rights movement. And they'll tell you that 
the protests that they see and the scale that they're happening, the frequency that they're happening, the anger behind them, this is stuff that that you know it almost outweighs what it what what they saw during the civil rights movement in terms of the scale and the enormity of it. Yeah. Now, whether or not whether or not the issues are the same and whether or not the the focus is is uh, you know where it should be, I think that's a that's a different issue, but the the point is is that there's a there's a lot of frustrated people right now in the United States. Um, I think a lot of it is justified. A lot, there's some of it that that I think isn't, and I think that social media, the 24 hour news cycle, and a lot of that plays a part of that. Yeah. And uh, you know we had we had spoken a little bit about that, um, but again, you know it's it's the the thing that we all have to do is listen. And and that 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 applies to both sides. I mean, I, and I like I said, the reason why I think we are where we are is because in general, you, the platforms that would typically you know where we would have a discussion, we're we're not discussing any. We can't even decide whether or not to wear face masks in public. You can't you can't decide an issue like this with a meme level education. That's what <laughs> no, I call it, and yeah, I'll say it. Yeah. Okay, I, I, no, that's it, it's it's a meme level education and a meme level fight and uh i'm uh, you know i was born in 1970 um I, i've i've learned of, about the civil rights movement from living relatives and in, in the books what disturbs me about what we have now and and really bothered me uh, when organizations and businesses out of out of frustration and need to do something supported uh, Black Lives Matter, as in the hashtag Black Lives Matters in the organization, because that's a rudderless, leaderless movement, mm. and there was that didn't exist in the civil rights. You had Martin Luther King. You had those figures with the goal. With this is what we need to do. I'm not seeing that now, and I think that's what's yeah. making it so dangerous. Well, and I, I will say, I mean, you have to remember, too, during the civil rights movement, I mean, you you had the Martin Luther King, but you all his philosophy compared to Malcolm X's philosophy was completely different. Yeah, yeah different You dudes. know, and yeah. so, but but the point was is that you, it was more, you had more centralized leadership. You're right. Right now, I think what, what we see is there there are so many voices calling for so many different things, expecting so many different results right and there's there's there doesn't appear to be a clear leadership structure um and you know I, now granted just my opinion on this uh but when you when you look at when you look at what happened in uh, to george floyd and you realize that everybody was on the same page it, it was it was once the rioting and the looting started that I think you saw so many people yeah, diverge. That, that a lot of folks tapped out. Where a lot of the point. support kind of, yeah. you know, started going different ways. And on the flip side of that, you know, I, I I always tell people, it's like, look, when it gets to a point like this to where you have such a large segment of our society uh, that is angry and, and taking to the streets, we don't we don't have the ability to no. control what that looks like. Well, you know, I, I have some friends that are that are way, way on the left. And they always in discussion about this and these are close friends that i can have these discussions with yeah they their concerns and and discussion centers around the emotion which like it or not is as real as numbers Mm. you can't get around that it it becomes a fact if it's a belief if it's if it's that that old and what i'm seeing from my end uh People are calling for police reform, but the things that are coming out feel more like punishment. They that that and I and I get it, I get it with the the kind of the zeitgeist that there's an effort or a desire to punish police. So we have people going after qualified immunity. I'll not argue. Uh, I good friend of mine's a lawyer. Uh, another friend of mine's very well educated in constitutional law. There are elements of qualified immunity that have caused some bad things, let a lot of bad people go. Um, but you have to look at what it accomplishes because if you completely do away with qualified immunity, now you've got Atlanta where a bunch of cops go, wait a minute, if if I shoot someone in self-defense, I get to go to the electric chair or you know, wherever they use it now over there. Sure. You don't have a police force and you still, 
And again, when you say police in the United States, you're talking about thousands of agencies, each with their own command structure, each with their own governing bodies. And you have federal and state and local levels. And anything you want to do to improve your police is going to cost money. Because when it comes down to it, it's a job market like all others. Yeah. You got a four-year degree. If your police department wants you, you're competing with the FBI mm. for paying benefits and duty station and stuff like that. So it, it's we stepped in a mess there on, on, the, on the cop side of it. Well, you know, the, the most fascinating thing to me as I've, as I've, you know, every now and then you see another video and then another video and then another. Yeah. And at some point you have to sit here and ask yourself, you know, and, and it's not about, you know, asking cops to not do their jobs. Right. But you have to know in an environment like this, making a big mistake is Dude. going to mean catastrophic consequences. Um, you are under a microscope. Yep. And people, people right now are just looking. And, and again, as I say in my, my article that I wrote, you know, my, my grandfather was a cop, one of one of two yeah, black I, police yeah. chiefs in, in uh, uh, you know, the area where he was, you know, and right there in the Philadelphia area. And when I when I have these conversations with my uncle or, or uh, um, uncles, if you will, or my aunts, what they'll say is he was he was a true peace officer, a guy who never had to pull his gun because of the respect that he had Mm -hmm. in the community. And I think that that, that is a big part of it. I think that you can't, you can't just label all police officers, you know, as, as pigs or whatever you want to call them. I feel like that is not going to achieve much at all. I think it's counterproductive. Um, I think that you do have to hold cops who are not, doing their jobs accountable. Yeah. But it's it's just like any other profession. It's just like any other profession and you are you're going to have mistakes that happen. Um and when those mistakes happen, you know, as a society, we have to be we have to be okay with handling them in the appropriate manner. And and that, I think that's why yeah. that's why you have people who look at uh, the issue and I'm not advocating for or against, you know, I just seeing the rhetoric it's clear to me that when people talk about going after qualified immunity it's because they feel that oftentimes when a mistake gets made right there is no repercussions the the slap on the wrist thing and there are there's a weird i'm still struggling to understand it there's a weird uh, uh case law requirement or case law switch in it that can allow that to happen and, and, and that's something that i think does need to go away uh someone uh I, I had a conversation with a doctor about it that was said said there ought to be some sort of system uh uh along the lines of malpractice yeah you know medical malpractice and how that works and i'm thinking man do we want to drag the insurance industry into this but um and uh but, but I get it. I, I do get it because you can see the horror stories. Again, you don't get to see the not horror stories, and that's a big thing. We we had I had this conversation <clears throat> with a friend of mine about no knock warrants, mm-hmm. and he he was talking about these horror stories of no knock warrants, and I said, well, I've served a lot of no knock warrants, and here's what a successful no knock warrant looks like in the newspaper. John Smith was arrested at 1234 Main Street by the Nobody County Sheriff's Office on three counts of aggravated assault with a period at the end of it. Now, when that screws up and they hit the house next to him and there's a shootout and somebody gets killed, now it's a no-knock warrant. You know, it's huge. And the discretion of the no-knock warrant is up to a judge on what what the applicant uh, applying agency sure. says. And a lot of people don't know that. They, they're just not aware of those facts and how it works. And I will never deny that there, is, there are systemic problems. We talked about uh, Philadelphia with what's the rapper's name? Uh, oh, uh, yeah, Meek Mill. Yeah. He, uh, Pre-Giuliani uh, days in New York. Mm-hmm. Man, I mean, entire, entire shifts, entire divisions are on the take. If you have a systemic problem like that in your department, that's something you got to look at, but it may not be in your department. So again, we're not national federal police. So maybe if, 
if uh, you know Matt County Sheriff's Office has a problem with corruption, don't do things to cripple Brandon County because they're doing just fine. They're under leadership. And keep in mind, this is my thing. My my whole uh, le- leadership is, is is my thing, and that was that was steeped in me all the way back to my high school Civil Air Patrol days. If your qualifications are like in the old days, like uh, like one of my sea daddies told me, if you were big enough and mean enough to carry a gun and you had a high school diploma, you're a cop. Now, what kind of a leader is that guy going to be? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So Nobody, yeah, nobody knows. <laughs> there, there we go. Nobody knows. Yeah. So, yeah. and then you, you get into that and it just becomes a malignancy. So, that's my thing on the police end of it. It's not, there's no blanket reform across the United States. It's hard to picture when you read this, but policing in the United States, if, if you were to look at all of us, all the cops, however many hundreds of thousands there are, and you got to think about it, you know, Midland, police, sheriff, constables, uh, you know, DA, uh, you know, municipal bailiffs, you, you have uh, emergency management cops, environmental police, you you just you just have this all these bodies and all these bodies we're at the peak of education and training best equipped least violent most capable of of de-escalation most capable of stress management than we've ever been ever in the history of the united states so yeah sure and i and i believe that. i mean not all departments but i'm saying if we're if we're going to look at the great big numbers i think that's where we are yeah so you really have to look at Exactly, that one. Is that one guy who did that, is he stupid or is he a sociopath Mm -hmm. or psychopath? Or do you have a systemic problem? You know, do you have a perfect storm? Well, and and, and that's what, you know, one thing that I always try to do, and it's it's difficult because your human instinct, it it almost forces you to want to take a side. Um, And I, I try to do my best in all situations to look at both sides and figure out, Exactly. First off, what it what it, what it, what are both sides saying right now? Right. And oftentimes, I feel like that gets lost in the conversation. You know, so many we spend so much time yelling that we don't really even know what each other is saying. Um, and and you know, that, a perfect example of that is the defund the police issue. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. But you know, I I what what people I think would say. Rightly or wrongly, I, I don't know. But I think what people would say is that if you if you see one case of it, that's just one case that you saw. But there could be many other cases that are out there. Right. Right. And so I, th- I think when people talk about, uh, you know, the need to, you know, rethink policing, I think that's the logic that they're going off of is that if if Joe Blow did this, you know, and we've seen this happen, you know, five or six 30 times or whatever the case may be, then the issue itself might be much larger than just that one specific cop or that one specific precinct. Right. Whether that's true or not, that I don't know. But that's the argument, right? And so so where do you go from there? And and this is the reason why I believe that listening and communication is so important because you, it, at least from what I've seen, and granted, I've, I've just kind of, you know, in a lot of ways tuned out a lot of it because... It's, it's very clear to me that there's there's no real uh, direction. It's just people yelling at each other. Yeah. And that's not just fun to listen to on a daily basis. I mean, I, you know, t- I, I do my best to stay engaged to a, to a point, and then you realize that life is still going on as right. well. Your life. Yeah, my yeah. life is still going on as well. Uh, but it, I, think it's, I think it's critical. Like, in, in order for... In order for what people are asking for uh, to be something that they accomplish, I think it's critical that we we bring the sides together and have a conversation about it. And this isn't just something that applies to the current issues at hand regarding police brutality and, and racism. I mean, you know, the, every single th- every issue in this nation now is just politicized to the point to where battle lines get drawn and everybody's just lobbing grenades. And I'll tell you what I equate it to. It's just like when I worked for your dad. And we'd be sitting out there on a lazy, hot middle of the day. And 
kind of slow. It's too hot to be doing work mm-hmm. outside. And we're not going to be picking up airplanes until the evening when they all start coming back. And we'd be sitting around. They'd have We had two or three dogs out there. And the dogs would be laying there. And one dog would raise its head and start barking at something. And their other dogs would get up and just start barking because that first <laughs> dog was and has no idea. And, and that's, it seems like an issue pops up and people will go, I don't understand that, but I agree with Brandon. Where is he on this? Okay, I'm with Brandon. He, he says no. He says it's crap. Yeah. And, and that's what I see. I see on, on, <laughs> on the meme level education well, I'll, on I'll Facebook. Give you, I'll give you, a, it's both a funny story, um, but also I think a good indicator kind of as to where we are in terms of um, our failure to be able to effectively communicating and effectively listening. My brother Brian, um, he might not even want me telling this story, but I think it's hilarious and I don't think he'll mind. So I'm going to tell it anyway. Let's do it. Uh, so he he's uh, uh, in Austin, and of course the protests are happening big time in Austin. Right. Uh, they're happening everywhere. And uh, he decides, you know what, I'm going to go down to one of these protests. And if you know, if you know my brother, you understand he's, he's, the, he's one of the greatest guys I know. You know, it just has a heart of gold. And so anyway, so he goes down to one of the protests and maneuvers his way through the crowd and uh, makes his way to the front and ends up kind of just taking the microphone from the person speaking and was going to, I think in retrospect, he thought it was going to go much better than it did. Um, He gets the microphone though and everybody starts cheering him. And so he tells him, well, don't cheer me just yet. You don't (laughs) hold on. Yeah. You you, you don't, you don't know what, you don't know what I'm going to say. And immediately they start booing him. And he was like, well, don't boo me either. You don't know what I'm going to say. And so he starts out and he goes, not all cops are bad. And just got completely, I mean, at that point, everybody's ears shut off. He gets booed out. Nobody's listening to him. And he gets escorted out. And that was that. Was that. Wow. But the interesting thing about that is if, if you know my brother and you, you understand the level of wisdom that he has, and if people were just willing to listen to him in that given moment, who knows what could have happened? But instead of, of, you know, thinking logically and, and, and artfully about how are we, what is the best approach that we can take to achieve the, the best possible outcome, people are just angry and they're acting out of that anger. Not everybody. I mean, you, you well, do have yeah. the peaceful protests and, you know, but, but, but you do have the, the rioting and the looting and all that stuff that's also happening, which is causing a lot of distortion. Right. right. Um, but, but, yeah, I think that to your point, that's kind of where we are. It's, it's. It has become, no pun intended, so black and white, so binary. You know, we're living in a world now of zeros and ones, where if you're not a zero, that means you must be a one. And if you're a one, well, then you can't be a zero. And the reality is, is that the human condition is so much more complicated than that. The lines are blurred all the time. There is very much a gray in all things. And we are we are failing one another because we're not taking an opportunity to discover what that gray area is. Yeah. Yeah, because it's usually in that gray area that you find commonalities, you find That's, an understanding and a way to move forward on exactly, issues. exactly. I, I'm having I'm having such a hard time with the mask thing right now. And that's a, <laughs> that's a that's a beautiful example. And and it it I mean, Facebook, dude. I hate Facebook. I know. It's, it's I was awful. on a I was on a cop board on Facebook, which is normally interesting. It's normally swapping information. Uh, job market. Mm-hmm. Austin guys are getting jobs in other places. They like to hell with that. And hey, bro, things are good over here in such and such county. Come come up this way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've seen people swapping uh, policies. Do you guys uh, have a policy on I mean, tasers? We need a new one. Can we see yours? Oh hell yeah! And I mean all this networking and and jokes and yeah. Man, I had a shit day. I just need to vent that kind of thing. Suddenly, the anti-mask memes started popping up. The, the, you know, this is a mind control device. And I thought, man, this is what people talk about when we need to be held to a higher standard. We are supposed to be public safety professionals. Mm-hmm. And don't you think if you, 
you know, if you want if you want Trump reelected, if you want the economy to open, don't you think that would help? You know, <laughs> well, if if mass work, well, how come we got to do social distance? Well, it's 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 a multiplier. Okay, we call we call it a force multiplier in gunfighting. You know, and it, it's so it's so frustrating. And and I, I I make a lot of people mad when I say this, but choosing a political party often means picking out which sciences you're going to deny. And <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a very, <laughs> right. you know, it's, it's a very interesting thing. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know when exactly uh, we got to a point to where we stopped being able to critically analyze information. Yeah. I don't know when that happened, uh, but it's definitely, it appears to be where we are. Um I don't understand why every single thing that we deal with in this nation has to be Republican and Democrat. I just don't. Well, I take that back. I kind of do. And a large <laughs> part of it is the, the, the media says so. Yeah. The media yeah. politicizes everything. And of course, you know, when you live in a nation where we consume the media in the fashion that we do 24 hours a day, seven oh, yeah. days a week. Yeah. Yeah. It's no. It, yes. Actually, I, I take that back. Yeah. It, it's well, very clear. You can't. You just you can't escape it. That's I, I haven't watched cable news in uh, a little over three years. Mm-hmm. I just don't do it because I it was. Um, you know, I'd have it on at work or whatever, and I quite literally had relatives in their deathbed sucking in cable news. And um, it, it, why? You know, I, <laughs> Gen X are here. We were, you know, I was taught to be a responsible citizen. You need to know what's going on. Keep up with politics. Keep up with world events. Well, that meant an hour in front of the TV, maybe while you're eating dinner, you're listening to it and you read the newspaper. Sure. It's not. I, I want to see if my cousin's hemorrhoid surgery went out okay, and let's see. It say, oh yeah, fifty-seven political memes and all on on your Facebook before you get there, and you're just like, man, this is. You just can't take it, and I'm seeing the effects of a full drive now. I, mm-hmm. I know I have problems for my treatment. It affects your uh, cognitive abilities and your memories. But at some point, you're just full. Like, it's like you can't learn another <laughs> damn thing and keep up with the news cycle and all like that. I've turned completely to the intellectual dark web because what's magic about that is if you follow 10 sources, they kind of converge in one point. And that is much easier to follow. Yeah. It, it, well, I say it is in general. So. Well, and, and I think that if the same philosophy was applied to the way that you consume your news, you'd probably find the news does the same thing, but you you can't watch Fox News and watch CNN. Can't no. watch CNN and watch Fox Fox News. You can't be either and watch MSNBC. You know what I mean? It's yeah. so yeah. everything is so. Fra- uh, uh, it's a world full of factions now, and that's probably about the only fact that there is is that we are living in factions. And at some point, um, it's going to get itself figured out because yeah. it always does. And, and one of my favorite quotes is, again, I, I said this during the campaign repeatedly, it's a Winston Churchill quote, that you can always count on the Americans to do what's right once they've exhausted all other options. And, and <laughs> yeah. it, just, it, is, yeah. it is so clear to me that that's, that's where this is going. Um, we have an opportunity to do something about it. We all have an opportunity to be a part of the sort of change we want to see. But we first have to figure out what is the change that we want to see. And I, and I don't think people understand that because, again, nobody's listening. Yeah. Nobody's listening to each other. And I, I, I tell my friends this, you know, like, like you said, I get I asked the question all the time. Well, what do you think about, you know, do you believe in racism? And I tell people, yes, I've experienced it. Of course I believe yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Like, what are you talking about? Like, you, you don't have to – I mean – Granted, I think that the, the, the experience with, with racism, you sometimes you do have to experience it to understand that it's a real problem. Right. Because I have a lot of friends that, you know, don't think it, that it's an issue, you know, but it's like, well, but you, there's no reason why you would ever experience it. But when you do experience it and you have experienced it multiple times over the course of your life, you understand that it is a real thing. Um, you know, but with that said... What I always try to get people to understand, and, and especially in a situation like what we have now with these riots, 
it's not about for me I, I tell them this it's like look you can choose not to listen you can choose not to understand why the things that are happening are happening whether they're justified or not that's a different conversation the point is is that you have a very very large faction in this country that does not appreciate or agree with the way that they are being treated because of what they perceive to be based off their skin color now you can you can choose to try to understand it or you won't but i promise you one thing if as a nation we don't come to grips with what's happening we're going to see it again and again and again yeah because there's one thing that i would never encourage somebody to not fight for and that is equality now again the question comes into play for a lot of people and this is just me seeing it from from the other side right well, and you get this question a lot. Well, what what do you mean? Everybody has equal rights. We all have the same rights. And I tell them yes, but for a lot of people, they don't get to exercise them in the same fashion. Right. And and what I mean when I say that is, you can you can you can have a situation in which you know you do have a black guy who has a concealed handgun license, and somehow he still ends up dead because he was reaching for that concealed handgun license right, when right. he had a gun. And when people see that and then it's magnified on, on a platform like Facebook, it's natural to think that like, oh, well, that's a bigger issue than it might be. Maybe that was just that one case. Maybe it's not. But it's still, uh, it's still a reality if, if, it's, if, if it lives in other people's hearts and minds, it's a reality regardless. Right. And, and to your point, when you talk about statistics and <laughs> you know, I always I always find statistics to be yeah, to be an interesting yeah. thing because they they both tell a truth, but you can also create your own story based off of them. You can, and uh, that's that's one of the things when you when you no matter how you how you flip them around, police are doing a pretty good job of use of force compared to uh, of, of contacts to use of force. Okay, yeah. so contact, uh, answering a call, traffic stop, whatever, but. Uh, you need to look at those in your community, yeah, because they're going to be totally different. But uh, all the lights were going off with what you were saying, and I want to bounce something off to you. And I'm going to begin by completely screwing it up. I, I was actually going to print it out. <laughs> That's with my, the best my, way to begin. My, my internet's dead. Um, I'm going to kind of summarize it by what I walked away with, and I've listened to it about six times. Uh, it was Brett Weinstein. Uh, who said, speaking of intellectual dark web, this is where we are. And I, I, it, he's hard to understand, but uh, when he was talking about systemic racism, he says, if you, if you follow the history of the United States, and if we, if we deal specifically with black people having come over, brought over, and been a slave race, and then gone into... Uh, uh, emancipation into Jim Crow into into all that. Even if the people today are by and large not racist, we are still living with the ghosts of the racism past. Where wherever that comes from, whether it's a kid in in the inner city who would not dare try to become a nuclear physicist for some for some reason where whether it's uh, a cultural thing where you just don't do that or he doesn't have the opportunity those things still exist whether or not I'm a racist you know the white guy on the other side of town how, does that how true does that ring in the middle of all this I, I, th- I think that when when you look at what's happening right now the the reason there's a reason why there's a lot of people that don't understand what's happening right now. And they don't understand what's happening right now because it has never been their experience. Ah. And so it's, imagine that. Imagine, that would be like me. Um, it's, it's why it's hard for me to imagine what combat or war would be like, having never been shot at or been to war. It has never been my experience. But I don't have to go to war to talk to somebody who's been to combat and they'll tell you that war is a terrible thing. Right. I trust them. That's a good point. I can trust them to understand, having been there and been through that and been in the middle of a combat zone, that, yeah, 
if they're telling me it's not pretty, that it's probably not a good thing, um, what what sense would it make for me to argue with them, having never been there? And so I think that that is a similar thing that's happening now. You have people, you know, who have, and I'm not saying you have to be black to understand the black experience. What I'm saying is, if you're not black, you're going to have a different experience, <laughs> right? Right. You know? And so I think I think you have a similar thing. Um, but I think that you have a, a lot of people that are willing to empathize at the same time. When you look at these protests and the way that these protests are taking uh, place and unfolding, I mean, you have people of all races that are, right, that, are that are right. in support of this, uh, you know, the, the change that people are calling for. Um, I think it's I think it's incumbent upon all of us as citizens of this country. If we don't understand all you have to do, you the only thing you have to do is listen. Right. You don't even have to agree, but you do need to listen because at some point you don't know when it's going to be you protesting and you're going to hope that whatever grievance you're protesting about people are willing to listen to you um and like i said it's if 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 people don't want to listen if they don't want to take this opportunity to learn uh, and better understand what's happening in this nation and why more importantly why it's happening that's your decision that's your choice too but don't be surprised when we're back here again right because we will be back here again. And people ask me all the time, well, do you agree with what's happening? I tell them, it doesn't matter whether or not I agree with it. The fact is, is that it's happening. All right. And I'm doing, even as a black guy in this country, I'm doing my best to, to better understand it all. I, and but, but what the hell, as a black guy, as, as any guy, what the hell do you say? Right. When people talk to me about it, and 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 I'll say it here in public because I'm retired and I can say this kind of shit now. <laughs> but when you in in Midland, and I don't even know what our demographics are. Um, what are we eight eight nine percent or is it is it higher? Oh, black I, it, white. I want to say eight or nine sounds yeah. about right. It's it's pretty low. It, it, it's pretty low. But again, keep in mind, I went into the academy on the heels of Rodney King, so. I'm a different generation of cop mm-hmm. than, than before. And whether when you deal with someone who's black as a complainant, as a suspect, as a random citizen or whatever, compared to any other case, it's like you handle them like a grenade with the pin halfway out because I can screw up 10,000 things. I damn well better not screw this one up. Sure. I'll kid you not. I have been in interview boards where they were, we'd sit all day and have people come through and come through and come through. And they said, well, did you pick John Smith? Well, no. Why? I'm like, well, you know, no experience. The experience, this, this problem, that problem in his interview was shit. And, you know, there were three slots and three badass candidates. And they go, okay, we just want to make sure there was a reason to it. And you flip through it, and that's the one black dude. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's sort of where we are. In my world of policing now, I've never worked in Detroit, Philly, you know, even Dallas. So, again, my my scope of it's not exactly what it is, you know. And and I, and I do I I, I can th- there are systemic things, but it's uh, it's it's just hard to grasp how big law enforcement is. Yeah. How huge we are. Yeah, yeah. And and when people use terms like militarization, stop the militarization of police, what does that mean? Well, I think if I, you I specifically want to know what what that means. I, I think if you I think if you ask 10 people, you'll get 10 different answers, which is which is why there's right. so much confusion over the term defund. You right. have so many people saying so many different things right. that yeah, it, it, don't be surprised that people are confused. You know? Uh, you know, the cops don't need armored vehicles. I can tell you what it sounds like to be a cop in an armored vehicle with bullets bouncing off of it. I love my armored vehicles, bro. <laughs> I do. Uh, and and the, the simplest answer that I have to what they call militarization, which is long guns, body armor, uh, tear gas is not militarization, folks. Uh, what, what are we missing? Um, yeah, armored vehicles. Pretty much armored vehicles and long guns. This is, is just the M, like the MRAPs? Uh, yeah, MRAP yeah. And, and all like that, which 
um, there there were our federal grants that they would give us these things. We had M113s with tracks on them. Mm-hmm. You know, people, that's a tank. I mean, it, it looked like a tank. It wasn't a tank, but they were free compared to what it would cost to to get a bat or something like that. Their civilian was a lot more expensive. And a guy said, uh, was talking about how intimidating they were. It was a real cool conversation to have with a guy in California. And I told him, no one wants to pay for an armored Suburban. Holy hell, that's expensive. But you get something like a bat, it's going to look like an armored vehicle, but it's just essentially an armored ambulance. Yeah. You know? So, but, 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 uh, one last thought, and I'm done. And I, I don't mean to interrupt oh, you. No, you're I've, f- got a, I've got a stream or I'll forget it. This is fine. I, I um, enjoy the conversations going. This what way. sets the police's level of force is or should be the level of threat. Yeah. That's, that's it. Well, and, and, and that was, that was going to be my next question to you. Um, you know, because it seems to me that it, it's, it's, there are, there are appropriate times when you need an MRAP. Right. When you need an armored vehicle. And then there might be times when it might be counterproductive to show up to a place with one. And I think that's I think that that looking at it from the other side, that might that could be the argument. Right. It's like this is a peaceful protest. Why do you need? But it can be. But looking at it from the cop side, too, it's like, well. And I and I even hate to say this, but I hate that we're at this point to where the, the level of frustration is such that. Uh, people think it can be justified by ever killing a cop. Yeah. Um, again, that is that is what I mean when I talk about the the importance of communication. Cops, <laughs> and, and we've seen, you've lived it. I've just seen videos. I've never been a police officer, so I can't sit here and tell anybody what it's like to be one. But I've seen enough videos where the level of instigation that takes place the fact that you conduct a routine traffic stop and you think you you might be issuing a warning at the end of it maybe a ticket yeah next thing you know you're not you don't have the opportunity to go home to your loved one right um there's so much uncertain in that profession that i quite frankly i i god what a difficult job but at the same time um uh, i watched a video last night um I highly recommend anybody who wants to weigh in on the cop subject, set about two hours aside and watch police activity on Facebook, um, YouTube. And I've seen, I saw a couple that were just cops that I know the tone of their voice and the way they walked, that guy was done. He'd had it. Yeah. And that guy called him the wrong name at the wrong time. Yeah. And that was it. And, and I'll, I'm going to tell you a story. This is, this is one of my favorite cop stories. I worked in the jail. And I was with a buddy of mine, very good friend. Uh, he is a high-ranking administrator in another agency now. And we worked in a jail. And we were dealing with uh, a bunch of lockdown gang members. And they were assholes. I mean, these guys are terrible to deal with. <laughs> and uh, the jail climate crunches in on everybody's brain it was hot and it was overcrowded and i mean i was boom i was up to here and this little aryan brotherhood punk mouthed off and he said the golden words if you didn't have that badge Mm. whatever and my buddy we were wearing gun belts which we'd have guns because we were in the jail and he was to my left like you are and I snapped my badge off and I put it in my pocket and I grabbed the keys out of his holster. And man, I was just, that was it. I was going to, I was going to ruin this guy. And my buddy put his hand on my chest, pushed me away, and he took those keys. And he, he said, and we were in the academy mm-hmm. at the time. And he said, You are, you have a shot at the highest academic award in the academy. And probably marksmanship. You're going to ace the academy. He says, don't throw it away here for that piece of shit. And I just whew, felt it all leave my body. And I was like, thanks, brother. Thank you. And he put the keys. Uh, no, wait. I put the keys back in my holster. That's what it was. 
I put the keys back in my holster and we were walking away and that guy threw a cup of piss on us. And I looked over at my buddy and you think, if I don't look white right now, you could see the red flush into his face and he reached for, for those keys. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I'm grabbing him going, hey buddy, look, you've got a good career ahead of you. You've got, you know, let's, let's get out of here. <laughs> and that, that's what accountability looks yeah, like. Right there. That, that's yeah. it. And, and you, you have to do that. Not only do you have to train for those moments, but I see a lot of those moments screwing people up and, and, and we're training now to not only uh, de-escalate and manage your own stress, but when you see it, not, and I see that fail a lot. Sure. And uh, the Floyd incident, you've got those rookies running around like, you know, Beaker on the Muppet Show. They have no idea what to do. Yeah. Um, and that's a problem when you have those kind of numbers of new guys out. You're, you're going to have new guy stuff. So I, I don't know their whole story. I haven't looked through it, but – those are the those are the things you know the people stuff you're going to deal with well and you know i i think that i think that when i when i look at what's happening right now um for for there to be that level of accountability amongst each other uh i think that would go a long way too. yeah i think that would go a long way too you know i look i think i think you know, just to wrap this up, it, it seems to me that again, um, we it's it's easy to live in America and all put ourselves under this label of American, and therefore we understand each other because we're all Americans. Well, yes, we are all Americans, but that doesn't mean that we understand each right. other because we're all Americans. And there's there's, I mean, if 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 it's not evident, it should be. There's a very 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 big difference in of opinion uh, when it comes to what exactly being an American means. Um, it's why you it's why you have people that feel like, you know, be, because of, you know, issues surrounding racism and police brutality that they want to kneel. And it's at the same time, you have people who also love this country so much that they, they you know, can't stand the idea of watching anyone disrespect the national anthem. And if you're if you're perceived as disrespecting the national anthem, well, then that means you're perceived as disrespecting the men and women in uniform. And right. And but really, I think what it comes down to is, I don't just me be looking objectively at it. Again, it, this just appears to be a very big misunderstanding <laughs> that I think it, it's hard for people to understand unless you sit and have a conversation about it. Um, and I feel like that that way on a lot of issues. There 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 needs to be some level of dialogue that has to take place, if in fact what we want to do is better understand one another. If we don't, you know, I think we can keep looking at issues through our own perspective, through our own lens, and um, you know, unfortunately, it seems like that's the approach that we we appear to right. be taking right well, now. Well, I I honestly feel we're leaderless on both sides. <laughs> I really do. I, I, you know, I, I mean, yeah. because, you know, how do you come to the table when uh, we we don't have we don't have a clear picture of what either side really wants to do? What two people? What two groups can we put in a room? Yeah, and especially um, come to terms with realistic solutions and then how do we correct um cultural and that's one thing i don't understand Mm. you know well uh uh it's multiculturalism uh or forced multiculturalism things like that's never worked out really well Mm. in the course of history i don't even know that i understand well the concept behind one of the most a book i read by the most liberal type of person college professor was the person who said it. Um, when you make a melting pot, you get little Italy, <laughs> you, you know, uh, uh, yeah, Chinatown. Uh, Chinatown yeah, and, you get these. And yeah, you, you get all that stuff. We just immediately kind of separate ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we do that. But the, but then endemically, there's a way we can, we can still manage. It's not like you're going to have a melting pot. You're going to have more of a salad. Yeah. We can still pull it off. But we got to overcome things like like we're dealing with now. Yeah. My brother, I feel like overcoming a steak. How about you? 
We'll do that. Nothing. If if every <laughs> if everybody would have a stake at the end of a conversation like this. Yeah, yeah, we should, yeah. man. I, <laughs> I did. Uh, we we every once in a while I'll cook I'll cook something before, but uh, I figured we would wait till my wife gets here and we'd all we all show up and eat. Well, if I if I can if I can just do one thing and it's knock it's it out, to, man. To, to just leave your listeners with just uh, I almost called it sage advice. But I'm not that wise, uh, you know. But I just, I just know the understand the importance of listening to people who are wise. My my brother has a he he. It's one of his favorite quotes, and I I laid it out in that article that I wrote. And it's by a guy named Ram Das, and I think you know what he says is we're all just walking each other home. I've never been one who naturally enjoys division. Um, I would much rather bring people together than separate people, whether that be along race, party lines, gender, whatever the case may be. Um, I certainly have political views. Uh, Those political views certainly lean more conservative. Uh, But that does not mean that I am incapable of looking through my own two eyes objectively at a situation and understanding the good or the bad in it. And so what I would encourage people to do is have your political views, have your beliefs, but also have empathy. And recognize that this nation completely depends upon us being able to work together. And if we're not going to do that, then who knows? History would say we fight it out and then figure it out from there. But we've done uh, it before, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we've done it before. <laughs> but do we really want to get to that point? No. You know, I think that I think that you know we are a civil enough society to where we should be able to uh, discuss our differences through dialogue. And I would just encourage anybody who's listening to this um, to, again, when you when you seek information, don't seek it to affirm your own per- perspective and your own beliefs. Seek it to educate yourself. And when you have the opportunity, which is just about 24 hours out of the day, before yeah. you can say something, before you choose to voice your opinion, think about the impact that it's going to have. And then lastly, what I would say is we need to all do a better job at listening to one another. And I think there's no perfect time than right now. I think when you look at the situation that's happening, this is the perfect time for us to do a little bit more listening than we are talking. Uh, And I think, again, if we can if we can achieve that, if we can do those things or even if we could just practice them, I think we're all going to be just a little bit better off as a country. Uh, And I think that we'll find ways to uh, uh, come closer together and, and heal a lot of the division that we currently see. So. That's that's all. Um, as always, it's fun to be in here with you. I appreciate the opportunity, um, and uh, I'm sure this won't be the last time. No, very well <laughs> said, man. I, I really appreciate you coming in, and I am flipping through my phone. It, I can't find the publishing date on, on that article. It's in the Odessa American, uh, OAOA.com. Also, Brandon's uh, Facebook page, you'll find a link to it, and I'm going to go ahead and link that article. Uh, oh, that, yeah, in that'd the, be great in the comments for uh, YouTube and our audio viewers. And we do thank our viewers very much. Uh, Audio folks, if you would, stop by YouTube sometime. Give us a like and a subscribe. We always appreciate those. And Brandon, thank you so much. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to spot you. Oh, I was about to say, it's it's bad luck. to During the corona, during a pandemic. I just had a test. We're good. (laughs) (laughs) Be safe. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah.